I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and today we are going to be playing with a good old friend, Wilton's Violet Icing Color, to dye some yarn with food coloring. Yes, you can dye yarn with food coloring, as long as you make sure you have the right type of yarn and the right type of food coloring. Uh, to dye yarn with artificial food coloring, you need to use a protein-based yarn like wool or other types of animal fibers. Unfortunately, you cannot dye plant-based yarn like cotton or synthetics like acrylic and polyester with artificial food coloring. Wilton's Violet contains red number three and blue number one, two very common artificial food coloring pigments found in the United States, and I've shown in many videos that this works really well to dye yarn. The last two things you need to dye yarn with food coloring are heat and acid. Uh, we'll be using white vinegar, and we'll talk more about how we're gonna heat set this yarn in a few minutes. To get ready for our project today, I measured out two heaping spoonfuls of the Wilton's Violet Icing Color and dissolved it in half a cup of warm tap water. I used a two-thirds teaspoon measuring spoon and a quarter teaspoon measuring spoon to measure out the dye. I am personally comfortable using cooking pots and pans to dye yarn with food coloring in my kitchen. Um, however, I happen to want to use some of my dedicated dye equipment for this project. And when doing so, I make sure that none of my food safe items come into contact with any of the dedicated dye tools or equipment. So I will go wash these spoons. This is a brand new cup that will become dedicated for dyeing yarn. And that's sort of how I transition to measuring out food coloring for dyeing. Uh, using food safe things and then transitioning to dedicated dye things. But I'm only doing this transition because I want to use my larger steam pan to show off the scribble technique I want to do today. I have pre-soaked 300 grams of Knit Picks Swish DK yarn that is 100% superwash merino for about an hour or so in just some plain tap water. There's no acid in here yet and there's also no acid added to our dye. And we are going to be dyeing this in an immersion steam pan with a squeeze bottle to do lots of scribbles on the yarn multiple times uh, to create something that is tonal-esque. But I say that with an asterisk because if you've watched any of my videos, you know that Wilton's Violet will break. The colors will separate in a very dramatic way and we'll see pinks and blues come apart. Since we're layering the colors, we may end up feeling something more purple overall, but I'm very excited to see how this will turn out using a color we know breaks compared to the acid dye that doesn't necessarily break dramatically that I used for this technique previously. You do not need to have a steam pan for this technique. You definitely could do it in a kettle, um, but since my squeeze bottle is normally used with acid dyes, I figured I may as well use my favorite steam pan. So I'm not gonna add some more water to the cup. It will dilute the dye more. I think that this is an eight ounce bottle. I only started with a half of a cup of liquid because that was just an easy amount that fit in this little cup that I could measure, but now I'll rinse it out one more time. I could have worn gloves when I was measuring out the dye to begin with to protect my hands from staining, uh, <laughs> but I didn't. Okay, and now we are ready with our dye. Even though it still says indigo, it's Wilton's Violet. My steam pan is sitting on two burners on my gas stove, and I added 16 cups of water with four tablespoons of white vinegar. This is a proportion of acid to water with the pH of my tap water that works really well for dyeing yarn with Wilton's food coloring. And now I'm gonna add our yarn. There is enough water in here that we will be able to access more than just the top layer of fiber. You can see that the yarn 
is floating a little bit, which is good because we want color spread. If we wanted less color spread and wanted the colors to sort of stick where we place them, then you would want to use a lot less water, probably less even than eight cups. But I'm going to turn on the heat to start heating things up. When it comes to food coloring, I prefer to add the acid to my dye bath where the yarn is versus adding the acid to the dye itself. And the reason for that is the red number three pigment, this pink pigment that strikes to yarn really, really quickly and causes this beautiful dramatic breaking, can crash out of solution when exposed to acid. And so sometimes you might notice some particles floating or like a halo of color around the edge of your pan. And one way to capture as much of this red as possible is to let the acid come into contact with the dye when the yarn is present. And so that's just a little tip I have. But now we're gonna heat things up and start adding the color. We are heating up and I'm gonna reduce the heat. Things are only a little bit steamy so far, but well, that's still pretty good. And now what we're gonna do today is take our dye and we are going to just scribble it on. You know, maybe some curly cues, some lines, some dots, and we're gonna have a lot of some random fun with it. Now, in future flips, I when I start adding it, we are gonna keep going and not stop. But I wanted to pause here and let things sit for a little bit so you can get a feel for the type of breaking and drama that we can see with this color. I think our concentration of acid is high enough that we may not see the most extreme breaking, like we can see sometimes with dip dyeing. But even over here, you can see the purple like center and then this blue spread that we are getting. Uh, and I think that if I wait a little bit, it could get even more dramatic. On the micro level over here, you can see like a shift of like super bright blue outside of the pink. We have breaking here for sure, but if you wanted to see the breaking be even more extreme and have less of that blue sort of capture right where it's placed, then I recommend starting with even less acid than we had here to uh, make the bright blues and pinks shift even more. But this is the spread we see without me helping anything, without me moving. And actually it looks like in those couple of moments, things did strike pretty quickly. I'm not seeing a lot of color come and move, but I do want to give one other example before we start going in heavy. I am going to come in here with another line, but this time I am going to press on it right away. And see how we get more of that blue spreading out and moving around. Um, and that over here, there's a little bit, but there's some red and purple in there. But here when we pressed and help those colors spread out, you can see more of our reds in there surrounded by the blues. And so this is something that we will see through the course of this entire project. And now we're gonna start really scribbling and applying the dye, because our goal is to eventually have some amount of color coverage throughout the entire yarn. And to go a little bit heavy, we have a lot of water volume in here. We can go tighter, but we will see these like pops of color surrounded by something that may get more and more bright as we go. Uh, it might have a very subtle kind of broken feel overall, but we'll see sort of where we end up with this. But I definitely am thinking that if I were to redo this, um, I'm already considering doing this with slightly less acid to start to make some of that breaking we're seeing be even more dramatic. Um, but I am still very, very excited with where this is headed. And I'm not waiting uh, very long at all. I'm coming in and flipping the yarn now because, 
Ooh, we even see some like pink spread. Um, it's okay if we have color spread. We kind of want that, but I also want it to be less of just like a pure tonal and so we'll have those like little pops of color and we're just going to keep layering the color onto the yarn. Sometimes letting it sit a little bit first, sometimes we'll wait and help it along and we'll see where we end up. But when I did this with the orange dye, doing this with Wilton's Violet was one of the top questions. And I figured I may as well start with the acid proportions that I used in that video before uh, coming along and doing this again. And so I have not tapped it yet, but I let some of it sit for a minute before adding more and now tapping it just to add I don't know, things that are a little bit different. Um, I'm excited. And so, yeah, we will carry on. When doing this technique with an orange acid dye, we found that the colors softened as I moved things around. Because while some things did strike pretty quickly, not nearly as fast as the red number threes from food coloring. Food coloring can strike pretty, pretty quickly, especially on superwash yarn. The goal is just to keep layering the color and have something modeled, something that eventually, when we use up, or if we use up all of the dye here, it may end up feeling a lot more subtle, a lot less dramatic with these pops of color, but we'll see where we end up. And I mentioned this in the other video, but this is a technique that is a lot more hands-on than just pouring dye onto the yarn and letting it spread. But sometimes dyeing is about the journey that takes you to get to the final color and not just uh, the destination. And so if you enjoy a technique, even if it's more hands-on, go for it. But anyway, I continued to scribble the dye onto the yarn and without waiting very long, I would either press to help move some of those colors around or flip the yarn to expose more uninterrupted white patches and continued layering this color more and more and more. There isn't necessarily as much breaking as maybe we all would have expected, but I did have a little inkling when I used a proportion of two tablespoons of white vinegar to eight cups of water that that could happen because to get the most dramatic color breaking with dip dyeing or other techniques, often I will start with a proportion of one tablespoon of white vinegar in eight cups of water and the results are also more dramatic when I use a non-superwash yarn. So if you would like to see me repeat this whole process on non-superwash wool, uh, leave a comment below and please subscribe to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video. But I'm absolutely happy to revisit this again. Okay, we have our finished color and I rinsed out the bottle to use every last bit of dye. And things are feeling fairly, fairly purple. When you layer dye over and over, even if there's dramatic breaking, you start to get more averaging of the colors that you see. And I did once do a side-by-side -side comparison of kettle dyeing Wilton's Violet in, all in one pot versus doing it in three layers with the same amount of to dye total on each. And the color was still broken when it was done in multiple layers, but it was more even and less dramatic. I would say that like the orange, things have sort of created this tonal with little pops of color in here. And it's very pretty. And right now it's feeling like a lot of purple on purple, but I know that as it dries, uh, some of the subtle breaking that is still in here will be a little bit easier to capture on camera. Now that I am done adding dye, um, I am going to add four more tablespoons of white vinegar. Uh, I don't think it's absolutely necessary to do this because almost all the color is in the yarn, but having a bit more acid does not hurt at all. Um, and we're gonna let this heat for 30 minutes. It has been 30 minutes and I'm now going to turn off the heat and we're gonna remove the yarn 
to let it cool completely so we can wash it. It's amazing how like lavender the background is from just layering everything. Uh, it's always fun to see whether things are dramatic or not. But I'm going to set this aside to cool. And meanwhile, I wanted to point out, it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but we do have a bit of a pink halo here on the sides. That'll come off with soap and water, um, but that can like add like a stain to your yarn, and so it's worth just keeping that in mind. But if I added, say, the Wilton's Violet dye to the pan, we would see a lot more of that than what we have here. Let's wash our yarn. This is so pretty. Uh, way more monochromatic than I was anticipating, but I've talked about that a few times now. Um, I've added this to the pre-soak water to start washing, and I'm adding a little bit of some clear dish soap. Oh, and want to add cold water. Uh, but yeah, I'm not anticipating color bleeding and I'm not seeing any color come out in the water. That is always wonderful. <laughs> oh, always wonderful. But anyway, I'm going to rinse out the soap. Then I'm going to put the yarn through my spin dryer, which is something I like to do because it just removes a lot of the excess water. This is not an essential step in any kind of way. You can remove the yarn from your rinse, sort of you know, remove the, some water like this and then hang to dry as is. I just like using the spin dryer because it means the yarn dries that much faster. And then once the yarn is dry, we'll take a closer look at our colorway. Here is our food coloring dyed scribble yarn. And there is breaking, but it is significantly more subtle than I think all of us expected. There are some pops like over here where you can feel the more pink, but otherwise you feel a lot of purples with then maybe a more lavender, slightly pink edge to some of it. I probably should have started with less acid. I think that I really should have started with less acid and potentially let things sit more before moving it so that way we could have captured the reds and let the blues spread a little more, but I'm also happy with what we achieved. In all of the videos I have done with Wilton's Violet, sometimes I get the bright pinks and blues, but if the acid is a little bit higher, sometimes I see more purple and pink, which at times has really confused me until I've realized, okay, if there's enough acid, that seems to be more of what happens. So is this broken violet? Absolutely. Looking at it, there are areas that have a lot more blue in them, areas that are more pink. But because we did so many layers, that meant that the colors and the breaking that we see is less extreme. If we wanted to have more dramatic breaking potentially, uh, another thing that we could have done is used non-superwash wool. We see dramatic breaking at time with Wilton's Violet because the reds strike faster than the blues. And so you get more dramatic breaking the more you can separate the difference and the rate that those colors bind to yarn. So if we had less acid in a non-superwash yarn, the reds would probably still strike really, really fast because that's what they do. And then the blues would take longer so they could spread more. And so... Yeah, that is just a way that we could conceivably get something different. But I do really like where we ended up today. Would you like me to do this again on non-superwash yarn with less acid to see if the breaking is more dramatic? Let me know in the comments below because I am always willing to play around some more with Wilton's Violet food coloring. I started my own yarn dyeing journey, dyeing yarn with food coloring because I had a lot of 20% wool, 80% acrylic, off-white yarn and I wanted some color. So I went to the grocery store, grabbed some Kool-Aid and the rest is history. And while I don't dye yarn with food coloring very much anymore, it's something that I will still do time to time because I think that food coloring is a really great way for someone to explore whether or not they enjoy the process of dyeing yarn and playing with that before investing in commercial dyes and 
extra equipment and things like that. Plus it's a really great option if you get a skein of yarn and you don't really like the color and you want to change it to something else. It's a very easy, accessible way to play around with color and yarn. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and if you enjoyed this video please subscribe, turn on notifications, and give the video a thumbs up. All of these things are the biggest way that you can help support the content here on the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel. Of course, I also have a Patreon and an Etsy shop where you can find hand dyed yarn that has been featured in my videos, which I think makes the yarn extra unique because while you're knitting with it, you can go back and see exactly how that yarn was created. And that's not something that you can do from a lot of different dyers. Thank you so much for watching.